to get us started. Great. Well, good evening. Thank you again for participating tonight. Um, our equity conversation um, with uh, creating a community of belonging. We are doing this, as you have seen, probably in the marketing materials every Tuesday in February. Um, tonight, the focus is on financial stability. And then next week will be a focus on health. And with the following week, um, February 23rd, that would be a focus on next steps. What can we each as individuals do? And what can we as a community to build a community in which all individuals feel that they belong? So again, this meeting will be um, recorded and transcribed. And also if you could, and if you haven't done so already, please update your display name. Um, you'll just click on your video, select those dots, and you can choose rename and you can list your name pronouns if you wish to do so. So thank you for um, everybody who's willing to do that. And I apologize for those who have heard this several times because you got on early, but we want to make sure everybody has a chance to hear that. So um, my name is Stephanie Munsterman Scriven and my pronouns are she, her, and I'm the executive director of the Cedar Rapids Civil Rights Commission. And um, briefly, my role is to uh, lead the commission's strategic uh, priorities to advance um, equity within our community. Uh, we also work to collaborate with other organizations such as United Way um, to um, ensure we have a community in which everybody feels they belong. And so for each one of these nights, um, Angelica found some really great questions. And tonight, the two questions around are around identity. So the first question um, that I will answer that Angelica and our um, speakers will also answer, um, what is the part of your identity that you are, are aware of most on a daily basis? And for me, um, the identity would be my gender as a woman. Um, that is what um, kind of the lens through which I see a lot of the world. And the part of I, the identity that um, I find other folks to most misunderstand um, for me is also around gender. Um, I am a woman, I am cisgender, which means my birth assigned at, my sex assigned at birth matches the, the gender that I identify with. However, with societal norms, some of my behavior, some of my actions, some of the way I speak have been construed as masculine. And so um, that's just one piece of your identity that that's the lens through which you see the world. And so I will pull it over to Angelica for her self-introduction. Thank you so much, Stephanie. My name is Angelica Veneta. The pronouns I use are she, her, and hers. I'm the Senior Manager of Volunteer Engagement at United Way of East Central Iowa. The role I hold there is um, really to work with our corporate and community partners in ways that create sustainable community change. And that's through engagement activities such as this, as well as volunteerism. Um, my identity answers uh, are as follows. So the part of my identity I am most aware of on a daily basis is my gender as a, sister, um, a woman. And the part of my identity that I believe is the most misunderstood by others is my ethnicity. Um, I have a fairly ambiguous in ethnicity here in the state of Iowa. I am biracial, but I am part uh, Samoan or Pacific Islander. There are not many of us uh, in this part of the country. And I do feel like that's often misunderstood in our community. Um, I am also going to introduce Kristen Roberts. Um, she is our president and CEO. She joined United Way last February. Um, I believe she just had her one year anniversary. And she works with the community on all levels bringing together the caring power to invest in effective solutions to help improve people's lives across our area. Kristen? Thanks, Angelica. I am Kristen Roberts and my pronouns are she, her, hers. And to answer those same questions, I think the identity of myself that I am most aware of during the day is probably the same with my gender, being female. I um, live with my husband and my two and my male dog. And so there is very much a male dominance in my home life. And probably the same answer as what Stephanie said would be the, um, the piece in which is most misunderstood by others. 
Stephanie and I were talking about how I've been called a dude many times because sometimes my decision-making capabilities, my ability to put emotions aside and get to business seem to somehow coalesce more with the male side that our society uh, assigns. I do want to just say thank you so much for being here tonight and just welcome you. Every month, United Way sends out a newsletter, and we have started to do many videos embedded within those newsletters. And this past month, we sent out a newsletter, and the video embedded talked about our DE&I efforts. And it was interesting because we were talking about how it's diversity, equity, and inclusion in the work we're doing. And we got a couple of responses back from the people we sent it out to. One of those responses clearly was just, three short words and it said, nope, not equity, it's equality. And then someone else said, I have to get this right in my head. They basically said, everyone has the same opportunities and people just need to work harder. And so being able to get those responses back is actually something that I was thankful for because more than anything, it shows us the work that we have within our community it shows us that we have people like yourselves who are here on a Tuesday night after you've probably sat through six hours worth of Zooms all day long and you are here just for you and for our community. So thank you for being here. We really hope that you get some sort of little nugget out of tonight and being able to move that along into conversations you have with others in our community. So thank you. Thank you so much, Kristen. I appreciate that. And I relate 100% to what you said. Um, the first piece on our agenda is, as you can see, this is a list of what the evening is going to look like. Um, you should have received an email that had an attachment of the poverty simulation worksheets. Um, so we'll be going through that and then we'll have presenters Q&A and if there's time, breakout session and reflection. Um, so first up will be um, Sophia from Horizons, and she will walk us through um, the budget simulation. And if you would introduce yourself, please. Hi, everybody. My name is Sophia DeMartino. Um, I will go ahead and share my screen if I can figure it out for this poverty simulation in just a moment. Um, my pronouns are she and her. Uh, the part of my, oh, my role and briefly how my work intersects with equity and financial stability. Um, um, so my first experience at Horizons, where I now work, was actually as a client. I had no idea I was ever going to work there. Um, I moved to Cedar Rapids, a single mom of two. I was on housing assistance, and I was in a program that was a partnership between the city and Horizons um, that allowed me to match the money that I paid in grant funds and that was accumulated and that's how I became a homeowner. Um, so I, that was my first interaction with Horizons was doing a, a homeowner program that absolutely changed my life. Five years later, I work here. I can't believe it. Still surprised. Um, so uh, my original role with Horizons uh, was as director of Meals on Wheels. Um, I spent about five years doing that. It was heavily involved in terms of food insecurity, not only for seniors, but for all people within the community. Um, and my current role is uh, community relations and grants director. So what that looks like is um, helping to build collaborative partnerships and projects uh, within the community to improve um, life opportunities for people and also uh, making sure that our programs are all sustainable across the board and all of our programs um, are, involve equity and, and financial stability. So um, role. The part of my identity that I am most aware of on a daily basis is race. The part of my identity that I believe is the most understood, misunderstood by others is race. It's race. Okay. So poverty simulator, let me find that. Share screen. Okay. Is it coming up? Did I double click it? There we go. Okay. So it's very tiny on my phone, but I can see it on my laptop. So hopefully everybody can see it. If not, everybody should already have a copy. Um, so what you'll see is that this is a, uh, the story you're going to have to put yourself in somebody else's shoes for a moment. Um, it's looking a little familiar for me. Uh, Jill is a 28 year old single mom of three. Uh, her kids are eight and three. she works part-time and she receives other support to provide for herself and her family. So what we're going to do is, um, look at Jill's income 
and then look at what she has uh, in terms of needs for her family and how we're going to make that work. Um, so the first thing on the list uh, expenses is, is housing. She's got about 2175 a month in terms of income. 350 of that is already allocated for uh, food that cannot go to anything else. Um, SNAP is only for food products and specific food products at that. Um, she also has FIP, that is Family Investment Program. That is a cash benefit that comes from the federal government. Additionally, she has a $1,400 salary from her part-time job. So her first expense here is housing. Now you may look at this list and say, oh, this is easy. I'll just choose that efficiency. But we have to bear in mind, she's a single mom of three. So when we look at the options that are available, she's got to choose the one that works best for her family. So go ahead and um, decide what... What would you do in Jill's? Uh, the second item on the list, utilities. Um, so she can either have basic utilities, she can have basic utilities and a cell phone um, for a little bit more, or she can have utilities, cell phone, and internet. Now, mind you, this may not be the highest speed internet, but internet nonetheless. Um, so make your choice there. The next option, healthcare for you. Uh, because your children are covered by the state. So Jill's kids must be covered by Medicaid, um, but she needs to choose a plan for herself or choose not to have a plan for all of the health-related costs that may occur for herself and pay the opt-out penalty. So make your choice there. The next item is food. So the first one on the list is budget basics. Um, it says it may not be enough for everyone. This is $350 a month for four people. I will just tell you right now that is not enough for everyone. Um, the next option is cheap and filling. Um, so cheap and filling, but maybe not so good for you. Um, that's $584 a month. And then we have low cost, uh, which, which includes some fruits and vegetables, $764 a month for four people. So make your choice there. The next item on the list is transportation. Is Jill going to walk or bike everywhere she goes with all three kids? Is she going to use public transportation at the cost of 40? Or is she going to own her own car uh, at a cost of $250 a month? So make your choice there. The final item on the list is childcare. So Jill can either leave the children with a family member who's not always reliable for free. She can rely on a licensed in-home daycare for $500, or she can choose a high quality provider with training in early childhood education for $715. So make your choice there and then add up what your total is look. So again, Jill's original income was $21.75 per month. So if you're taking a look at your um, expenses at the end, total expenses. If you want to just type in the chat what you're looking at for total cost, I would love to know what people are coming up with. And I'm going to look at that here on my phone. Eighteen eighty-two. Twenty-three seventy-six, twenty-three forty-six, fifteen sixty-six, twenty fifty-six. Okay, so I mean some that are a little bit above the budget, some numbers that are right at the budget, some that are a little bit below. Would she qualify for child care assistance? We are going to get to that. Yep. Okay. So that's about what I expected. So some of the notes that I made to this poverty simulator, um, I just want to go over because I literally live this life. Um, and when I was looking through it, I noticed some things that didn't quite line up with my own experience. Um, so when we're looking at utilities, one of the things I want you to think about is budget billing and the unpredictability of utility cost. Sometimes things go a little out of whack. Sometimes you get bills that are more than you expect them to be. For someone who is living on a budget that is this restricted, that can be a catastrophic problem. They can end up with their power shut off. Um, Lie heat is incredibly 
helpful in the winter time to people cover those utility costs that can really skyrocket when all of a sudden you wake up in the morning and it's negative 17. I'm sure that has not happened to anyone here today. Okay, the next item on the list, uh, housing costs. Those didn't feel incredibly realistic for our area to me. A uh, bedroom and bath house for $700, I haven't seen it. I have not seen that in the Cedar Rapids area. Um, the quality of a $50 cell phone. Um, is that cell phone actually going to live up to all of the needs that she has? How are the internet speeds going to How are the internet speeds going to be should she choose the utility package that includes internet? Is that going to cover all of her needs? Um, a food budget of $350 a month is not going to cover for people. It definitely is not going to allow for much in terms of healthful foods. Um, parents typically sacrifice for themselves, leading to higher health care costs. And that will impact the health care line item, whether or not you chose insurance, because it's going to impact either you're paying a full bill or you're paying co-pays. And there wasn't much wiggle room in that budget for co-pays either. Um, transportation choices are going to impact where you're able to live. That impacts your other choices too. Like what amenities are available in your home? What the costs of those utilities are going to be? Do you have the register heater on the wall? Do you have forced air? Um, do you have an electric oven? Do you have a gas oven? These things are not when you're a renter. You are at the liberty of what they have chosen to put in place for you within the home that you could afford. Um, and that hopefully is accessible to the other places that you need to be, like school, like work, like childcare. Um, additionally, the quality of your childcare is going to impact educational outcomes for your children who are already likely to be doing worse in school because they're food insecure, uh, because they lack reliable transportation. And depending on your choices, they may not have access to the internet at home, an environment where the school districts have gone one to one in terms of technology and using that as a teaching tool. And we haven't even talked about the fact that we're in a pandemic right now. If you're in a pandemic and you don't have internet in your house, where you're going to choose for your child to be, you're going to choose for them to be in person because that's the best possible opportunity that they have for an education. You can't provide for that at home. And what does that mean for your safety? What does that mean um, in terms of your choices to keep your own family safe within the context of a global pandemic? And the other thing I wanted to mention is that the gap in childcare has been made a little bit better by programs like Head Start, but Head Start typically has a waiting list. Additionally, there was a childcare shortage crisis in Iowa prior to COVID starting. So now that the pandemic is here, we have lost a huge amount of childcare seats. Um, from daycares that are closing and are choosing not to reopen their doors because they were not able to survive the financial impact of this pandemic. Um, so essentially for people who are already making difficult decisions because their resources are limited, the only option truly available at least until they make it to the top of a waiting list is the unreliable family member. And that may cost them their job. For part-time low wage positions, Calling in more than once a month can cost you more than just your daily wage. Employers don't have to provide PTO for those jobs. And sick kids or sudden childcare emergencies can land you back in the one ads. I actually experienced this myself as an employee of MCI. I worked there uh, on a, a short-term basis and my child had an ear infection. So I had to be gone for two days unexpectedly and they allowed that first day. But on the second day, they let me know that they had to let me go because of her ear. So that's all I have for the poverty simulator. Um, I hope that was helpful for some people to put yourself in someone else's shoes and try and think through what choices you would have to make in that scenario. Thank you so much for walking us through that. I think if you've not lived in it, it's really hard to even imagine what um, choices and hard decisions folks need to make. So thank you for walking us through that and for sharing your own lived experience as well. So thank you. Um, Angelica, I don't know if you wanted to pop up the screen about um, some guidelines for engagement. Uh, we just wanna make sure we're all on the same page to have um, a brave and safe as possible um, environment for us to have conversations about some you know, pretty tough, pretty tough topics. Um, so tonight, as you know, it's about financial stability. Um, our commitment to you and to one another is to listen deeply and to learn from one another. Uh, we are here to help 
one another grow, help one another learn, um, and being willing to take those actions that can lead to the undoing of um, inequities. So there might be moments tonight where you feel uncomfortable and that is perfectly fine. There might be moments in time where we ask you to invite a spirit of curiosity. So come into this with an open heart and open mind. Um, if we do get to the breakouts, it's hard to say. So last time we didn't, there are so many wonderful questions. Um, but if we do get the breakouts, um, we will make sure to you know, share the air. Um, sometimes um, people have a lot of things they really want to share. So we want to make sure we allow time for everybody to speak. Um, as it says on the screen, we do encourage you to use the chat box. And you have all been doing that very well. So thank you so much. If you do wish to ask a question when we get to that point, you can use the raise the hand feature and a moderator, Angelica or myself will unmute you, or you can also type your question into the chat box as you have been doing along the way. And so next I'm going to, um, our next two speakers, I'm just gonna ask them to introduce themselves briefly and then um, they'll start. So Paula, if you could just um, introduce yourself a little bit and then I'll ask Denine to do the same. Hi, I'm Paula Land. I'm the Executive Director at Catherine McCauley Center, and I identify most as female, a woman. And um, in my role at Catherine McCauley Center, I tend to really notice my, um, my race, my ethnicity, um, perhaps because I am a white woman who leads an organization that um, provides services and advocates for refugees and immigrants, which I am not. Um, so I am very aware of that in my role. Glad to be here and glad to see so many people that have been tutors, our friends, staff members, board members. What a great group. It is. Thank you so much, Paula. And Deneen, please. And then you can um, share your um, time or your information. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thanks for participating with us tonight. Uh, my name is Janine Rushing, and I identify as she, her. Uh, and my role at the Willis Dady Shelter is that I am the Shelter Services Director, and I've been with Willis Dady uh, for 15 years this year. Um, the part of my identity that I am most aware of on a daily basis is that I am African American. Um, the part of my identity that I believe is the most understood by others is also that I'm African American. Um, I was asked once by someone, um, why did I choose the career path that I chose? If you were going to spend this many years uh, being passionate about something, uh, why was it homelessness um, and not something that was related um, to the African-American community? And my response is that in working with homelessness, you're able to work with lots of people within the community. Um, you know, a lot of times when we're at the gas station or we're at the grocery store, we don't know that some of the attendants that we see every day or even our neighbors may have experienced homelessness, you know, before in their lives or even could be experiencing homelessness at that time. Um, and, that, and that's just the reality um, of our society. Um, a lot of people that we see day to day may be staying at a homeless shelter and you just, you, you may not know. Um, and so... So I'll go into uh, my part um, um, of, of the conversation and just talking a little bit about um, uh, financial stability as far as the Willis Dady Shelter goes. And so first I'll start off um, by sharing a little bit uh, about our agency. Um, and so um, like I mentioned, this is the Willis Dady um, Homeless Services Shelter. And so um, we're located on the Southeast side of Cedar Rapids. Um, and we, we can shelter up to 25 single men, uh, and we can also shelter up to uh, six families. And so our families here at the shelter could be any makeup of a family. So that means it could be an aunt with her nieces and nephews, it could be grandparents with their grandchildren, or it could also be a husband, husband and wife with their children. And so typically clients would stay for about 30 days at our shelter. Uh, but I will tell you that uh, back in March of 2020, we did have to change that. And we changed it due to COVID. Um, there were a lot of clients that we had saw were experiencing um, difficulties as far as employment. 
you know, our society had really been affected as far as, you know, when COVID had really started to hit our communities. And so we saw um, several people, you know, lots of people within our community that had lost their jobs or, you know, maybe their jobs were, you know, had to downsize, you know, things like that. And so, um, you know, we did see an uptick in the amount of individuals that we were assisting um, at our shelter. Um, and so also, um, and so we also have an employment program. So that's definitely something that I want to touch on. Um, and so Emily Zimmon, who is our, um, she is our support services director here at Willis Dady. She created our employment program a couple years ago. And so her and her team have worked really hard um, to create partnerships um, with other um, employment agencies and um, you know, employment opportunities for our clients. And so one of the partnerships that she does have and that she's had for several years is with Frontier Co-op. And so, um, so we have a partnership with them where um, our employment team, they're able to interview and hire individuals uh, for the Frontier positions. And then we've also been able to um, purchase two vans to be able to provide transportation. Uh, this particular, um, the positions at Frontier are located in Norway, Iowa. And so we do have several clients that may have transportation and then we have others that don't. Um, we're also able to hire former clients as well. So individuals that have already obtained housing, um, there's different pickup sites around town. And so the van is able to swing by and pick them up and get them um, to their positions at Frontier. And so when the employment program was created, we definitely thought about the struggles that some of our clients may have in obtaining um, employment. You know, we have some clients that may, you know, have gaps in their employment for various reasons. We also um, work with individuals that may have criminal history, and that can definitely play a part in you being able to obtain employment. Um, you know, and with these opportunities that our employment program has been able to create, we have seen several clients that have uh, been hired on permanently um, in these different positions, you know, and so that's really great for us to be able to do that, um, you know, and also just thinking about some of the struggles that, you know, we've all faced um, over the last year or so, you know, in our community with um, COVID and how it's affected our jobs. Even us having this discussion right now, we're all on Zoom. And a year and a half ago, I don't think any of us could have imagined that we'd be meeting in this way. You know, so, so many things have been affected, you know, and that, that includes some of the people within our community, you know. Um, and like I said, here at the shelter, we have had to change the way that we do things here at the shelter. Not only are clients staying a little bit longer, um, but, you know, we're also working more intensely with them to help them um, identify housing. And after derecho happened um, in August, that kind of threw a wrench um, in there a little bit, you know, because already clients were, um, you know, working in a small pool of being able to identify housing. But when a lot of those housing options were affected by the storm, that really kind of, you know, lengthen the time that we see clients here at the shelter. And so, like I said, our case managers are working double time to be able to try to identify different housing opportunities, you know, for individuals that were already struggling. Um, and so that's just a little bit of, you know, kind of some of the struggles that we see in the population that we serve. Also, we, we definitely work with clients that may be, um, you know, struggling with other issues as far as mental health you know, other issues as far as substance abuse and things along those lines. Um, and kind of what Sophia had touched on is that, you know, um, having medical insurance is very important within our society. When you're looking to be able to address your mental health, if you don't have the proper medical insurance, you know, you, you may not be able to get the proper services that you need or even just being able to uh, pay for your medication. 
you know, and a lot of times what we've seen in the past is that there are some individuals that if they're not properly taking their medications, sometimes people do self-medicate with drugs and alcohol. And so we, we continue to work with our clients to try to address those needs and address their barriers. You know, we create an environment where clients are able to stay here at no cost. Um, and we work with them, like I said, very intensely to try to identify employment opportunities and also to be able to address those barriers of mental health, substance abuse, um, you know, employment, housing, all of those things during this stay. And I did want to mention that um, I also oversee our winter overflow shelter that's located on the northeast side of Cedar Rapids. Um, and so... At our, at, at our main shelter at Willis Dady, we see anywhere from, I would say, about uh, 50 to 60 individuals uh, at one time. And at our overflow shelter, we work with about 75 individuals. Um, and so this particular location is a low barrier shelter. So what that means is that um, individuals that may have higher barriers or individuals that may be really struggling within our community are able to come to this location and they're able um, to be there, receive the same services that our individuals at our main shelter are able um, to receive. Um, but I will say by being a low barrier shelter, we do see um, more of those struggles with mental health, more of the struggles with employment, and more of, um, you know, the struggles with substance abuse, and also for individuals being able to obtain housing. Um, we currently have an individual that's there um, that does have some pretty serious mental health struggles and has had for several years, and our agency has worked with them, um, but she's back at our overflow shelter, and um, she has a few evictions. And so it is going to be a more difficult process for her to be able to obtain housing, um, you know, but everybody in our community deserves to be able to have a warm and safe place to call their own. So we are actively working with her to help address those barriers and also to be able to work with her in identifying um, long term housing. Um, and so I guess I didn't talk a lot about my role in particular. I kind of talked about our agency and what we do and the population that we serve. And so in my role as being the shelter services director, um, what I do is I work very closely with our um, frontline shelter staff in creating programs um, to be able to assist clients and support them while they're in the shelter and also when they exit. And so for example, uh, we have something that's coming up um, this February in a couple of weeks, and it's called our um, self-esteem building workshop. And so the reason why this was created is because you think about um, individuals that are experiencing homelessness or individuals that are currently staying in a homeless shelter. Most times or a lot of times when clients come to us and they check into the shelter, it's really their last resort. If they're able to stay with a family member or a friend, a lot of times they do. And so when they come to our shelter, normally they've exhausted all those other options or those options don't exist for them. And so people are not always in the best mind frame or feeling good about themselves to go out and be able to obtain employment or go out to meet with landlords and have a smile on their face. And so we thought about, you know, what could we do to help build the self-esteem of clients? And so we were able to um, contact a barber and a stylist. And so they're gonna come, come down to the shelter. They're gonna cut the hair um, of some of our clients and shave you know, the faces of some of our clients. And also um, you know, doing some styling of the women's hair. And then we were also able to obtain uh, lots of interview clothing that had been donated um, to our shelter by you know, so many generous people in the community. And I saw someone shake their head. So they may have been someone they donated to us. So thank you. Um, and so on this particular day, the person will be able to get their hair cut, have a shave. And then we have a group of um, missionary volunteers that will assist them with the clothing rack and obtaining uh, a nice interview outfit. And so this is definitely something that our clients can have. And that when they're going out and they're interviewing for these different jobs, um, even if it's on a Zoom meeting, they'll be able to present themselves, you know, in a way that they feel comfortable and they feel confident. And also when clients are going out and meeting with landlords, they'll have something presentable to wear. A lot of times clients show up at the shelter and some people literally only have the clothes on their backs or they may just have a few items. 
And so this is an opportunity for them to add something to their wardrobe that they can be proud to wear um, when they're out and about. Um, so that's a little bit on my role on um, the programs that we try to create to support our clients while they're in the shelter. Um, and also, like I said, creating programs to support them once they exit as well. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing about Willis Stady and the important work you're doing. It's, um, it's much needed in our community, um, unfortunately, but I'm thankful that we have you. So thank you for the work you're doing, Deneen. Um, next, if we, could, we would have um, Paula share, and then following that, Sophia will share. I keep muting and unmuting myself. So I have a PowerPoint to share with you because I think it's going to be much more enjoyable than looking at me for the entirety of my presentation. So um, let's see, I always struggle with the very start of it, slideshow. So um, Thank you for allowing me to be a part of this um, equity conversation. Equity is definitely um, a big issue for our organization. We are con consider ourselves a place of welcome. Uh, prior to this um, uh, new logo and new tagline, our tagline was working together for an inclusive community. And um, I know many people on this call have been a part of that. So, um, Again, trying to get this to work from the beginning. There we go. So Catherine McCulley's mission um, is to offer hope and opportunity through educational and supportive services. And um, those services promote stability, skill building and connection. So it's very important that people have that sense of stability in their lives so that they are in a place where skill building can actually happen. Um, the neat thing about um, CMC is a number of people that are involved in um, helping with the skill building, about half of our volunteers, over 400 um, in a typical year, are involved in our one-on-one -on -one tutoring services. So connection, connection with the community, connection with the, um, within their communities, and connection um, with and relationships with their tutors. And our vision is that people embrace opportunities to better themselves, their families, and their community. And the reason this is so important is that for those people who walk through the door, they are there for a better life. And if they aren't willing to put in that hard work to um, make change and to take steps, even if it's um, steps that we might not consider like um, uh, qualify as success, we, um, they probably won't be successful at Catherine McCauley Center. So it really takes effort by the clients, the staff, the volunteers, and our entire community. I wanted to share with you our values, and I'm not going to read every single one of these, but these kind of give you a snapshot of who we are. And the reason I'm going through all of this is that this really provides the framework for who we are and why we do what we do and how we serve our clients. So um, knowledge is transformative um, and our future depends on communities that welcome, respect and support a diversity of individuals and ideas. And I think that's really what tonight is all about. So who we serve, we serve women in crisis who are healing from trauma. We serve adult learners from 50 plus countries and we serve refugees and immigrants. Um, a few years back, we did a, um, a little project and asked our clients, our students and our residents, what do you want your neighbor to know? And these are a few quotes um, from some folks that we've served. I wish to learn a be and be a better woman in my neighborhood. 
And a student who's learning English said, it is only language that separates us. As I learn more English, I become more and more outgoing and friendly self. And that really speaks to that level of competence. So both of these clients are really speaking to the confidence that they gain as they build skills. So um, just to give you a snapshot of those 50 different countries, you can see here all the countries in red are the countries um, from which our students um, have come from. And the demographics we're using are a year old because last year was such an unusual year. So um, we have found that the top country has definitely grown to be from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, and this is primarily the country from which uh, we resettle uh, our clients. So at Catherine McCauley Center, we really look at financial stability through the lens of gender, recognizing that gender does make a difference. Um, and when you, um, and also language. So a person's ability to speak English um, makes uh, a difference in their ability to be financially stable. Um, culture is definitely something that we take into consideration in all of our interactions and also can impact um, people um, as they uh, are dealing with the education system, as they're trying to get jobs, as they're interacting within our community, trying to access services. And then of course, trauma. So um, we know that pretty much 100% of the women in our housing program have experienced trauma. Um, and we don't always recognize the trauma that's experienced by people that we serve, uh, the refugees and immigrant, immigrants that we serve. Some of their life experiences have been very traumatic and have, um, have been a part of what has led them to flee their home country. And I um, mentioned intersectionality because this is where one or more of these factors come together. So when you combine all of these factors, if you are a woman who's experienced trauma, maybe went through genocide, you have limited command of the English language and you have cultural barriers, you're going to experience many more challenges to um, financial stability. What we find is that a lot of people really are confused between, <coughs> excuse me, understanding uh, the difference between a refugee and an immigrant. And the reason that this is important is because people come to the US with, in, with different statuses. So to the right here, re a refugee is somebody, oops, how do you go back? Can anybody tell me how to go back in a PowerPoint? You should be able to go up to the, there you go. Oh, okay. Um, so, um, a refugee is um, somebody that we serve um, through our resettlement program, but we also serve them through our education program as well. But they are somebody who is outside of his or home, her own home country and unable to return as a result of a well-founded fear of persecution on the grounds of race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. So um, in many cases, um, we've had families who have witnessed um, family members murdered. They have been in fear of their life. They have fled and spent time um, hiding in the forest and doing anything to find safety, um, finding their way to a refugee camp and gaining refugee status allows them the opportunity at some point in time to potentially become a US citizen. Um, this is a whole other presentation, which Sarah Zanich, our refugee and immigrant services manager or director, does an excellent job of kind of giving a refugee 101. So if you're ever interested in that, we'd love to be able to um, share that with you. An immigrant, on the other hand, is um, 
somebody who is moving to another country with the intention of staying for a certain period of time. So there, there's um, temporary visas um, and, um, but oftentimes, so immigrants can be, come as documented immigrants or undocumented immigrants. And one of the reasons the um, interesting thing is that some immigrants are fleeing their country for, for the same reason as a refugee. However, they um, have not been granted refugee status because their country, their population has not been considered um, as a, a refugee. And then asylum seekers are people who are fleeing their country and seeking safety in the US. So I want to just kind of make that clear um, that there is definitely a difference and the difference towards somebody's financial stability um, will uh, vary depending on what kind of status they come to the US with. All refugees who are resettled in the US come with a their um, with um, employment authorization. So they are authorized to work in the US. Um, so um, many of the factors that impact stability are, there are many, education. Um, many of the folks that we're serving in our education program, some come here with um, advanced degrees from their home country. And these advanced degrees are not necessarily recognizable in the US. So they may be a, um, a doctor or a lawyer in their home country and they are coming to the US and working in meatpacking um, because their credentials are not recognized in the US. And then on top of that, they may not have the language skills. So on the other hand, we may have um, people who have never had a formal education in their home country. So they have never learned how to read and write in their native language. So when you think about those individuals, we call them our emerging literacy students because, um, but when you think about that, they have an incredible amount, number of strengths. And at, at CMC, we consider ourselves a strengths-based organization because we really look to what are the strengths that people bring to the table and how can we use those strengths to help them in their um, desire to gain skills and to become financially stable. So um, for them, for these individuals, um, our emerging literacy students, um, the road to becoming proficient in English and being able to read and write in English is challenging when they can't even read or write in their own native language. Um, obviously, employ employment is affected. And um, one of the reasons is that, again, some people come here as skilled and some people are not um, as skilled. And so many of the jobs that they are taking are in the service industry or in meat packing. They may be the person who's cleaning your place of business or work in hospitals in food service or environmental services. And some of those are lower wage jobs. And as you know, through COVID, those have been the professions that um, people definitely continue to rely on whether we are um, in a pandemic or not. And so um, many of our clients have been exposed um, and being uh, considered essential, essential workers. Um, housing is a challenge. Um, affordable housing is a challenge throughout our community. And I think the derecho definitely um, um, added to that um, in that many, many affordable housing units were destroyed and um, are still in need of repair for those who are those um, homes that are repairable. Um, and when I say homes, sometimes they're apartments, they may be efficiency, one bedroom, two bedroom apartments. Um, and the affordable aspect of that is when you think about a woman who is single and she only has her own income to rely on, um, her options for housing are very limited. 
And when you think about a family, um, many of our um, African families that we've resettled are, can be larger. So there could be anywhere from six to eight kids. And to try to find housing that's suitable for a family that size is very challenging on the kind of um, uh, wage that they are going to be um, earning. I have another slide about housing on the next slide. Um, Childcare is a factor um, in uh, that impacts people's ability to um, be employed and um, because oftentimes it's very inaccessible and especially for um, those, as you heard, uh, saw Tracy put in the chat box about how much um, childcare has been lost in our community. We are trying to address that through our refugee child in-home childcare training and development program, where we are training women to um, be registered to, to open their own in-home childcare, which addresses the issue of um, childcare for those who need employment um, and also allows them to stay at home with their children or stay at home and make um, uh, and have an income. The um, transportation, many of our clients do not have a driver's license and so they rely on others within their community to help with transportation. And so I would say um, there's a very supportive and resourceful community. Our public transportation in Cedar Rapids is very um, challenging. And so like when you think about the program Deneen was talking about in um, out of frontier, that's an employer who's out of town. So clearly the bus system is not going to be um, accessible and, and helpful in that situation, as well as second and third shift employees. So thankfully we have services like NTS um, Horizons that help with some of that, um, that as well. But um, getting a driver's license and getting their own vehicle is one of the big goals for the people um, in our services and especially pretty much every family that we have ever resettled um, in Cedar Rapids. Food is um, something that I uh, really appreciate the fact that Haycap Food Reservoir has worked with, with Catherine McCauley Center to make sure that the food that we offer in our food pantry is uh, culturally appropriate. So um, that's probably one of the biggest um, uh, factors for um, folks who have a different dietary um, needs when they come to the US, they are not used to processed foods or fast foods. And so they prefer to um, make their own meals with fresh produce, with um, rice and beans. And I won't go into um, the whole list of foods that, um, that are helpful for our clients. And then of course, med mental and physical health are always a barrier. And when you think about accessing the healthcare system for a refugee and immigrant who has never had um, maybe healthcare system that they've accessed in their home country, um, this can be very intimidating, not really understanding things like prescriptions, preventative care. So our case managers really try to help remove any barriers to accessing um, that's supposed to say physical health. Um, and then as well, mental health is very stigmatized. And so um, talking about mental health is not something you just come out and talk about. You kind of go about it in, um, in talking about how they're feeling. Um, and when I say they, this is very generalized because this is obviously many, many people from many different countries, many different cultures. I'm just naming a few um, of the barriers. So there is a housing cost burden. When you think about somebody who maybe is, um, who is disabled um, for physical or mental health reasons, their income may be $771. If you think about a rent of $550, that is 73% of a person's monthly income that's going towards rent. And this is a typical one bedroom apartment in um, 
Cedar Rapids. So um, there are programs out there, but some of them are um, not always accessible and um, open for new um, enrollment. So um, very quickly, because I think we're running out of time. Uh, Catherine McCauley Center helps to address some of these challenges for the women um, in our housing program. And I apologize, I don't have a slide, but we provide safe and stable housing. Uh, women who've experienced trauma in their lives and are experiencing homelessness, fleeing from domestic violence, safety is a huge issue. So we really look to making sure that our um, space is um, uh, uh, created with a um, through a trauma lens um, to make sure that we're avoiding any of those triggers, making sure that people know this key is the key to your space. You can keep your door locked. Your stuff is safe in your room. And, um, and also to create that sense of community, that sense of um, support from one another. And then they can start working on the goals and um, finding jobs and overcoming some of their um, barriers like mental health, getting on medication um, so that they can become more stabilized and um, perhaps get a job, but perhaps not. Oops, I went back. Um, okay, so the uh, as I mentioned, uh, we do English as a second language. Shout out to all the tutors or former tutors out there. Um, citizenship, um, that is a goal for many people. Um, if you come here with refugee status after a year, you can get your green card. And then five years after arriving, you are eligible to apply for citizenship. Um, and this is not an, a cheap or easy process. Uh, we do resettle folks here in our largest year. We resettled 239 individuals in Cedar Rapids directly. Um, and I believe actually we also Waterloo, Iowa City and Columbus Junction. Um, employment services is huge, helping people find jobs. Um, we are also working on helping people really identify what their career path is and seeing how we can support them, not just in earning a livable wage, but to um, realizing some of their career goals. Um, and so all of that comes with training, with skill building um, opportunities as well. And then, of course, just helping people find the right door, get to the right service, and doing that in a way that is um, supportive because um, many people need interpretation. So we provide that interpretation. Rather than just handing them a business card or a phone number, we will actually help them make a call, an appointment, and um, usually accompany them to their first appointment so that they then know how to get to and access um, that service. And then, as I mentioned, our child care business development program. So this is a picture of our former space. Um, lots of people pre-COVID crammed into one little um, space learning about um, how to become a tutor. I think this was actually one of our tutor trainings. So that is all I have for now. And I look forward to answering questions later. Thank you so much, Paula. The seeing the the breadth and depth of the services and support you provide to community members is pretty astounding. So, thank you so much for sharing that. It was a lot of great information, and also thank you for I believe it's um, Catherine McCauley's staff who were answering some of those questions in the chat around <laughs> languages and support. So, thank you for answering those along the way. That's great. Really helpful. Yes. So thank you for that. Uh, next, um, Sophia, um, I invite you to share your uh, thoughts with us. So first of all, I just have to say I've, I've been doing work in the nonprofit social services field in the Lynn County for five and a half years now, and I've learned so much from both of your um, presentations tonight. Thank, thank you both so much for giving such so much information at once. Um, I'm going to go ahead and try and find my PowerPoint now, hopefully this will go smoother this time. Question mark, show all windows, let's try that. I had high hopes, you guys. 
there it is. Okay. So um, I am actually standing in. Who's calling me? No. <laughs> I am actually standing in for uh, Kelsey Badwell, who is our um, social stability director. Um, I am going to be speaking about inequity as relates to the FICO score. And um, I'm going to, this is her vision. So I'm going to do my best to do justice to her vision. Um, she was unable to be with us this evening. So, there we go. Oh, we can, maybe that only shows up for me. Whatever, it's fine. Inequity in the credit score. Um, so FICO scores. FICO scores were created in order to um, hopefully create an impartial system of ranking candidates for loans. So prior to the invention of the FICO score, uh, essentially you went in and you met with a uh, loan officer and he decided whether or not he liked the cut of your jib. And that was what determined whether or not you got a loan. Um, obviously, a lot of bias came in play a lot of oh I know Jim I trust Jim he lives down the street and go to church with his grandma you know he's a good guy I'm gonna give him a loan and that excluded a lot of people from loans so the goal of the FICO score was to create an impartial system now despite that stated goal good credit remains out of reach for many people the same issues that sustain the wealth gap create inequity within credit scores and lending as well so what does that look like? Um, ongoing consequences of past policies, including redlining. Uh, redlining was a policy that essentially um, refused mortgages in black neighborhoods. Uh, the exclusion of domestic and agricultural workers from the unemployment program. A lot of people don't know that. Back in the day, if you were an agricultural worker, if you were a domestic worker, you were excluded from unemployment insurance, insurance that did not apply to you. And these are industries that were largely, largely staffed by people of color. Um, the tipped wage is also something that was created in order to foster inequity inherently. Um, and initially that applied mostly to black and brown people, um, as well as the exclusion of black soldiers from the GI Bill. So the Accumulated effect of all of these policies has had impacts for generations. Additionally, uh, employment bias adds, contributes to the wealth gap. So black people earn 64 cents for every dollar earned by whites and Latinx folks earn 30, 73 cents, excuse me, um, to every dollar. Uh, inequities due to mass incarceration and discrimination and policing in fining and in sentencing also contribute to the wealth gap. Um, an example that I'm like dating myself a little bit, okay, but this is fresh in my mind, <laughs> the housing the housing financial crisis of 2008. I cannot believe it's 2021. Um, so within this crisis, uh, the housing, it was a big deal. The, the housing bubble, it burst, it was, it was pneumonium, okay. But what started coming out over the years that followed is that people of color were being targeted disproportionately for some subprime mortgages. And subprime mortgages carry higher interest rates. So they were getting these mortgages even when their credit scores and their incomes qualified them for loan products. The cost of credit was more expensive for them um, because they were targeted disproportionately, not because they didn't make enough money to cover the cost not because their credit score indicated that they were a risk to lend to, simply because they were targeted disproportionately. The rates of foreclosure were significantly higher for these communities. Nearly $400 billion of black wealth was wiped out because of the financial crisis of 2008 due to the housing bubble. Now, according to court testimony, some of the loan execs at Wells Fargo called the subprime loans ghetto loans and referred to black customers as mud people. This was not this was not something that they were not aware of. They knew that they were doing this was, was intentional, it was malicious. So why does the FICO score matter? If you think about wealth building, this, the, this is the biggest way that people build wealth in this country um, is through home ownership. If your FICO score is not high enough, you are not going to be able to access home ownership or it's going to cost you more to do so in interest payments, in PMI. Um, entrepreneurship. The barriers to entrepreneurship are higher if you don't have access to capital. Not only if you don't have access to capital, but another way that people start businesses is through borrowing from friends and family. If your friends and your family don't have access to that capital either, 
you are, are having a much harder time starting a business, becoming a, a quote unquote job creator, right? And, and building wealth for yourself. The price of credit is higher. If you need a loan, um, if you need a personal loan and you can't access that through a bank, you can end up at um, a, uh, I'm losing words today. <laughs> you can't your money. You know what I mean. Uh, these payday lenders. There we go. You end up borrowing from payday lenders and their, their interest rates are astronomically high. It is incredibly hard to pay those back. Um, the price of insurance. This includes auto insurance. Uh, other kinds of insurance is higher. Credit score is lower. And that's particularly ironic to me when some of the biggest names in insurance, including Aetna, including New York Life, uh, made their money by insuring our ancestors during chattel slavery. Uh, renting a home, that can be exclude. you can be excluded from renting a home because your credit score is too low. Uh, purchasing a reliable vehicle. Somebody had mentioned earlier, where's this lady, where's this Jill getting money for a car? That's an excellent question. I wonder how her credit score is. Hopefully it's really good. Otherwise she might not get one. Or it may cost her more because she has a, a buy now, pay now, you know, pay here, buy here, pay here, location where they have those higher interest rates. Um, additionally, getting a job. People will check your credit score to determine whether or not you are worthy of having a job. Um, here we go. This is Camille. And my notes have disappeared, of course they have. There we go. This is my friend Camille. Um, Camille was diagnosed with lupus when we were 15 years old. The doctor said she wouldn't see 30. What do you do when 15 and they tell you that your life is already half over? Camille did her best to do all the right things and live her life chasing the hopes and the dreams that all of us have. She worked full time at a gas station that didn't offer affordable health insurance. She tried to go to college, but she kept getting sick and missing class. The kidney transplant that she got from her father rejected and she had to go on dialysis three days a week. The loans she took out for school went into default and affected her credit score. Camille got up every day and made the best of it. Lupus attached her bones. She went to her best friend's wedding with a broken back and told her, I'm so glad I could be here to see you get married. I know that I never will. She had the opportunity to apply for a manager job at a different gas station where the pay was better. It was an upward career move with better benefits. And Camille was so excited for this opportunity. She applied for it and she got hired. Now, mind you, this is somebody who tried to go to college and couldn't do so. This is somebody who was so excited to go to her friend's wedding because she knew she would never have that opportunity. This was a huge opportunity for her to accomplish something and she was ecstatic. On her third day at her new job, they let Camille know that her credit score disqualified her for the position that she had already started. She had to go hat in hand back to her previous employer and ask for her old job back. The new gas station said that having a low credit score told them she wasn't responsible enough to be trusted with cash handling, even though she'd been handling cash at a gas station two miles away for 10 years. Camille passed last year in a hospital somewhere in Indiana that they shipped her off to because Medicaid is not as lucrative as private insurance and the hospital needed that bed to turn a profit. Because of the pandemic, we couldn't tell her goodbye. The day before she left us, she couldn't speak. So she wrote her nurse a note that said, tell Sophia I love her. When I got this job five years ago, she told me that she wanted her story to be told if it could help change things for the better. And this has been my first opportunity to fulfill her wish. Camille was 36 years old. So how do we change it? This is obviously not an exhaustive list of things that could be done to improve the situation. Um, I've got some things at the macro level, I've got local policy and then employer level. So Ayanna Presley introduced a bill last year and it passed the house in early 2020, but it did not quite make it through the Senate, unfortunately. Um, this included several changes to the FICO scoring system, including removing adverse information relating to predatory, discriminatory, or otherwise unlawful loans made by a financial institution. So those loans that went out during the housing crisis, um, 
they remain on people's credit score. There are people who were impacted by that for years and years and years. Uh, in terms of local policies, you can assess your city debt collection practices, particularly as it relates to fines and fees, and whether or not you choose to report those to credit bureaus, as that could disproportionately harm people of color. Additionally, at the employer level, forego credit checks as part of the hiring process. Now, with the global movement for justice that exploded last summer, serving as a catalyst for increased interest in learning and making changes to the way that we interact with each other, there has been an increased acknowledgement that the inequities we as people of color and particularly we as black people experience, however, necessary breakthrough that needs to occur beyond just awareness of these inequities and disparities at this macro external to self level. People are now willing to admit that mass incarceration affects certain populations more than others because of systemic racism. And that the wealth gap and credit disparities are also due to systemic racism, that these are tools of oppression. Now, if you, with this awareness, use these tools of oppression as part of the hiring process, as part of the lending process, you are participating in that oppression. So while it also exists in the macro scale, it's important to understand your own role in either breaking these systems down or continuing them. At Horizons, we have uh, several different programs and services. Um, we have transportation services, we have nutrition services, and we also have financial services. So because I'm here uh, on Kelsey's behalf, here's our contact information for our financial programming. We help with student loan counseling, to improve their credit score. We help people prepare to buy a home. Uh, we have rep payee services. If you or someone you know needs help in working on these issues, please get in contact with us. If you have any other questions about anything that we do, please feel free to call me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sophia. I really appreciate the the large explanation at the macro level, as well as getting down to how we as each individuals can make a change, as well as showing the disproportionate impact that these um, policies have on um, Black, Indigenous, people of color. They also have disproportionate on individuals with disabilities and women. So thank you so much for sharing that information. If there are any questions, you are welcome to either um, use the raise your hand function you can also put a question into the chat. Um, I do have one chat um, question that came through, and this is for um, Willis Dady for Deneen. It is, uh, job training is an important component to bridge the gap to financial stability. In addition to your employment partnerships, does Willis Dady offer training programs? Thank you. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, we do. We do provide um, training programs, definitely, um, for the individuals that we work with. Um, you know, even like I talked about the self-esteem building workshop, other workshops that we do at the shelter include um, job training and, um, you know, just working with clients on how to um, properly ask questions and answer questions in an interview. Also, you know, the proper attire to wear for an interview. Um, and as I mentioned before, even though some of these interviews may be on Zoom, still being able to provide those tools for clients as they're, you know, navigating through the, um, the journey of obtaining employment. Um, yeah, so to answer your question, we do provide um, training and assistance for individuals, um, you know, once they get on the job and also during their job search. That is wonderful. I, that's um, a question that we get sometimes at the Civil Rights Commission as, you know, we are trying to obtain a job. What are my, I already have these barriers based upon my protected class. And then you add in these other pieces, um, as well as uh, how do I become a good tenant? How do I be, um, that's another question we get quite often. Are there any other questions for the panelists? Otherwise, we're going to um, pop into breakout rooms. Um, it's going to be relatively brief with just a couple of questions. 
and then uh, we'll come back together. Um, it'll probably just be about a five minute or so. Um, I know that's pr quite short, um, but we want to give a chance for folks to um, have a conversation with one another, and then we'll come back together at the end. And we will um, share those some questions out that you can bring. Um, I would just recommend for each of your group, have somebody who is willing to take some notes um, and be willing to um, potentially share out some of the thoughts that um, rumbled around as you were having a conversation. So I will place um, some potential questions um, into the chat and then we can start moving folks over. Thanks, Stephanie. So you guys will be moved automatically into some breakout rooms. Um, and as she had mentioned, she's gonna broadcast some questions and put them in the chat. But really, we just want to talk about um, what policy changes do you believe would help lead to wealth equity? And also, in what ways can we help create a sense of belonging? This is an opportunity for everybody to reflect on all of the information they learned, but maybe to talk a little bit about some ways that we can help address this uh, racial wealth gap uh, in credit scores, in uh, being able to purchase a home, a lot of the topics, again, that each of our presenters have shared with us. So if you'll give me just a few minutes, you guys will be pulled into your individual breakout rooms. Thank you, Angelica. Welcome back, everybody. It uh, looks like we are starting to have some of our participants rejoin us in the main room. Uh, you'll see up on screen here that we do have our final polling question. Um, I was able to pop around a little bit into a few of the rooms. It sounded like we were having some pretty great robust questions. Um, if you wouldn't mind sharing any aha moments you may have had, either it was a moment of surprise or new information. I'd also be curious if anybody's interested in sharing with the larger group some things that you discussed you have been given the opportunity to take yourself off mute uh, to share with the group. Since everybody's scared to talk, I believe I'll say something. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> In our group, uh, with regards to what policies uh, that we thought we could deal with to address the issue of, um, of inequities, it, I look to uh, transitional justice as a means of addressing a problem that's been there systemically for over 400 plus years. And uh, the pandemic, this global pandemic is just another uh, clear indicator of the, of the inequities. In transitional justice, you would bring forth a commission, a group truth commissions also, the question of reparations will be brought forth, and even uh, prosecution of organizations that still uh, exploit people, they would have to pay. That's one particular way uh, other nations around the world, what they do when they see uh, something that was wrong for quite some time, uh, now they try to straighten it out and make it right. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, and I do see quite a few aha moments in our poll, our surrounding FICO scores, um, and just some of the resources that are available here in the community. Certainly um, the large variety of languages and cultures that we have in our community and how the refugee population is impacted differently than some of our other populations and just some challenges that we don't often think about. Um, is there anybody else who would like to share what they discussed in their groups? Um, I can share what we discussed in our group. Uh, I think that uh, we had a thought that was sparked by Paula talking about intersectionality and um, particular groups who are um, tend to be uh, very, I guess, ostracized and affected by wealth um, inequality and what um, we didn't talk about many specific policies that um, to some policy changes, but um, I was talking about in the context of uh, undocumented people and how a lot of the we, we know that um, the current 
federal assistance programs uh, that we provide as as a country don't even fully address the um, the scope of, of issues that that people who um, are experiencing poverty like face. And so when you look at um, undocumented people who are even uh, less qualified for those federal assistance programs aren't able to access those um, things, they they nearly have nothing. And so uh, having to be even more creative when you, when you aren't offered any type of assistance, uh, aren't able to have any governmental health care programs provided to you. And so um, looking at ways in which, well, they are looking at um, uh, creating new immigration policies that make uh, a more clear pathway to citizenship, which is great. Um, but at the same time, these people still need uh, health care and uh, other uh, needs being met uh, during the time that they are seeking citizenship. Uh, so just looking at ways that we can integrate um, uh, assistance for people like uh, the undocumented population uh, because they don't they don't have regular access to the resources that other people might have access to. Thank you so much, Ryan, for sharing. Um, Kevin, you also had your hand raised. Would you like to share what your group discussed? Yeah, we didn't talk that long. It was just me and one other person because I came in late. But, you know, like uh, I got the download of what, what, what was going on. You know, I, I kind of want to just throw a cautionary tone to everybody in, you know, I understand the idea of equity, people, you know, doing well and everything like that. I, the one thing I caution to everybody in thought, and this is it, at what point do we just go full, full, full socialist and pay everybody the same amount of money and we feel better about ourselves? Or, you know, you're saying that every, you know, the cautionary tone that I would say is, you know, the, there is always going to be people that make different amounts of money and have different outcomes, right? So that is in a, in a society that's, that's not socialist, okay? The one thing I'll say is, like, how far does this get pushed? So I, I would just caution people in going to the nth extreme in thought and idea that, you know, what do you sacrifice? Do you want to just pay everybody the same and then everybody lose motivation to strive? Because then everybody just gets paid the, the same or whatever or makes the same amount of money and blah, blah, blah. There's always going to be some kind of inequity as far, sorry, uh, unequal outcomes in a, in a society like that. Uh, what I would always say is choice matters a lot. You know, it, making kids aware of what choices to go into as far as professions, blah, blah, blah you know, in, in family structure, those type of things that are actually really, that, that do drive people's success. Like if we look at Asian Americans or Indian Americans, they thrive even as immigrants and they do the best out of anywhere in the country. So what I was, just, you know, I just want to put that out there because I, I kind of see some dangerous ideas in some things that are pushed like that. But I do want the best for a lot of people. And, you know, not everybody's going to always come out at the top of the heap and, a country that's not fully socialist. Thank you so much, Kevin, for expressing your opinions. Um, in regards to equity versus um, socialism and equality, um, equity and social socialism are not um, synonymous. Um, equity means that all individuals have the same opportunity and same access. The issues that we are discussing are around the inequities that are in our community as well as um, our country. And those are often placed upon um, individuals of color, um, individuals with disabilities, those who are from other countries. Um, so, but because of that discrimination, um, there are fewer opportunities afforded to them to obtain the housing that they wish to have, to obtain the jobs, to attain the education. And so I understand your concern, um, but I just think we need to be clear on the fact that equity and so 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 socialism are not uh, even the same thing. Um, they're not um, synonymous. Um, you can have um, equity within a socialist company, country, but then uh, but that's not what we're discussing. We're talking about the same opportunities for, for people have the same um, playing field. So thank you for bringing that up. And thank you for saying that, uh, Stephanie. Yeah, thank about, you, because I was going to say something too. <laughs> I, 
I figured I would take that one. So I, <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. You it very well. Jump on it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. And we uh, we do appreciate all of the um, the information that's being put into chat. Uh, we are running up against time and we want to respect that. So um, as a follow up, um, we will be sending out um, information, um, some links to um, some of the things that were put in the chat from um, the different folks, as well as reminders of upcoming events. Um, Angelica, did you want to, you can take that next one. Yes, absolutely. And I just wanted to add to, um, this is an opportunity for us to have uncomfortable conversations. It is very important to do so, so that we can really begin to uncover um, what we can do to address these inequities um, in things like financial stability, education, and health. I saw something the other day um, that I would just like to share that kind of ties in with that conversation. And Sometimes it's not so much that you yourself made good choices, but that you had good choices to make. So you had better opportunities and better choices to make than mm -hmm. perhaps someone else, depending on, um, again, your gender, racial identity, and many other sort of um, identities. But we do wanna move forward and talk a little bit about the inequities in healthcare. Uh, next month, we do have, excuse me, next week, we have several speakers who are going to be uh, discussing access to equitable, affordable, quality health care for those historically underrepresented communities. Um, a few facts that some of you may not be aware of. In the United States, Black women have the highest pregnancy mortality rates. And we will have Dr. Bennett speaking from the Eastern Iowa Health Center about um, offering those uh, healthcare services to minority women. We also have Okpara Rice from Tanager Place who's gonna be speaking to us about mental health. Some of you guys may not be aware, but mental health care, um, when it comes to mental health care, BIPOC and the LGBTQ community in general are less likely to receive proper treatment. They're less likely to seek that treatment and then when do receive that treatment, they're uh, likely to terminate that prematurely. And a lot of that just has to do with um, the misunderstanding on um, some of how to treat those individuals. And then Teresa Lewis is the executive director from the ARC of East Central Iowa, and she'll be discussing inequities for uh, people experiencing disabilities. Um, again, we thank you all for coming to join us today. The final week in this series is going to be for us to continue to discuss next steps. So we'll have deeper conversations about some of those public policy initiatives, but also some grassroots efforts. Um, I do see in the chat that we've been dropping in some um, contact information, which I will be sharing in my follow-up email as well. Uh, we will have this recorded and we hope to have that up before next week's So um, with that, I think we will end the session. Stephanie, do you have anything else you would like to add? I just want to reiterate my um, gratitude for everybody's participation in tonight and your willingness to come to uh, tonight with a, an open mind and open heart to learn from one another. So thank you for your grace and your willingness to remain curious. And we hope to see you next week for some continued uh, important conversations that we need in our, our community. Thank you, everybody. Thank and you. And stay warm.